Do you ever wish you could listen to these episodes on the go without leaving your YouTube player open? Well, now you can, because all of my episodes are available in podcast form. And if you didn't know that, well, now is the time to jump on board. It's free and it's easy. Simply click my Linktree link in my description box and it will pop up a little list with all my links for the project, social media, and of course, links for the podcast. All you have to do is simply click the link that says podcast and it will pull up a landing page to select your favorite place to listen to podcasts and just add mine to your list. Spotify users get a different button that says Spotify podcast because she wants to be quirky and not like the other links, but click on that and boom, I'm on Spotify too. It's just an alternative if you wanna download these episodes a little easier and travel around. If you like watching them here on YouTube, keep doing that, but just a heads up. So now let's get into today's episode. and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about Funimation. I'm gonna cut to the chase, and this episode's going to feature quite a bit of sexual assault. It's going to be very frequently mentioned and discussed somewhat extensively. So if this topic is gonna be upsetting to you, then I highly suggest not tuning into today's episode. But with that being said, we're going to begin with the history of Funimation and we're gonna go ahead and start with discussing what dubbing anime is and how Funimation enters into the equation. So let's get into it. For some, it can be hard to focus on what's happening on the screen while reading subtitles. Though the first ever dubbed anime was in 1963, the technique of dubbing itself has been used since the birth of sound cinema. One source claims that in the early 20th century, a lot of Europe's film going population had low literacy levels. Reading subtitles, especially if they were quick or had the potential of ruining a film's images wasn't ideal. Dubbing was also used for film censorship as the Italian dubs of films would remove any unflattering references to Italians and be spoken in standardized national Italian. And that was in an effort to prevent foreign words from entering the culture and prevent local dialects and minority languages. Even though dubbed content might be a bit more convenient for viewing purposes, it has also led to the sort of censorship or editing when it comes to westernizing shows and movies as well. For example, in the 60s, when Astro Boy was adapted into English, it explored a few themes that were deemed unsuitable for Western audiences like World War II and animal experimentation. Those storylines were altered or removed, the standard practice for an anime that wanted to enter the US or Western market. In the late 60s, the anime Speed Racer about a race car driver entered into the scene and did exactly that, adapting to the Western scene. According to the New York Times, he, Peter Fernandez, the voice of Speed Racer and writer of some of the scripts, took a quintessentially Japanese title and made it so Americans could enjoy it, said Egan Liu, the news editor of the Anime News Network. Speed Racer was one of the first titles that turned Americans into fans of Japanese animation. Those fans relished in Mr. Fernandez's rapid fire delivery. A lot of syllables were used in Japanese, Mr. Liu said, and to match the mouth flaps, he filled in the English dialogue with as many words as were needed. Others say that the poor reputation of dubs can be pinned on Speed Racer itself as it was hilariously ridiculous, squeezing in long complicated lines of dialogue into pre-existing lip movements. Speed Racer has long become a famous trope for its dialogue for the over-exaggerated emotion of the voice characters and the style of the show. Though it's a little difficult to describe the style accurately, I highly recommend checking out a clip or two if you've never seen this show and want to laugh. I kind of find this funny because I remember as a child, my dad actually showed me Speed Racer. It was something that he actually enjoyed. So we would like watch it together when I was younger. And it's kind of funny to watch it back now and just realize kind of the dubbing over on it. I, I don't know, it was entertaining for me at least. But anyway, slowly but surely as anime grew, so did the demand for better adaptations, no cutting scenes, and of course, better dubs. Apparently, Miyazaki's producer even sent Harvey Weinstein, who was notorious for editing movies at the time and not the far more criminal acts he's known for today, a samurai sword and a note that said no cuts on the blade. By the 90s and early 2000s, thanks to new technologies, growing demand, and more studios being founded to take on the task of dubbing, now the debate between dubbed versus subbed is less controversial, though not completely erased. 
And one of these studios, of course, is the focus of today's episode, Funimation. Funimation was founded on May 9th, 1994 by Japanese-born businessmen Jen Fukunaga. Dragon Ball was one of their first and most well-known franchises. Although Funimation didn't create the franchise, they were responsible for dubbing it. According to one source, it was Dragon Ball that got the entire company started in the first place. Fukunaka's uncle was a producer for Toei Animation Company Limited, a legendary anime studio that created some of the genre's most influential shows and films. When Fukunaka learned from his uncle that they would be willing to sell him the license to its popular action anime, Dragon Ball Z, if he started his own company and raised the money, Fukunaga convinced coworker Daniel Kockenauer and his family to sell their feed mill in Decatur and become principal investors in the new company. Within a few months of its creation, Funimation acquired the license to Dragon Ball Z. And a short time later, the company opened a small dubbing studio in North Richland Hills. They believed in this company so much that Daniel even sold his family business to serve as an investor to create the company. Although things didn't go smoothly right away, even after the license for Dragon Ball Z was signed that September, the series finally took off in the States once it became part of Cartoon Network's Toonami block. From there, the company kept growing. In 2001, they licensed the action series Yu Yu Hakushu and the science fiction series Blue Gender. The following year, they licensed Fruits Basket and held a convention at the Anime Fest 2002. Two years later, they licensed the original Full Metal Alchemist. Soul Eater, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and more massive anime titles soon followed. And obviously others took notice of their success. And in 2005, they were acquired by Navare Corporation, becoming Funimation Entertainment instead of Funimation Productions. Jen Fukunaga remained the head of the company though, becoming CEO around the time Funimation started taking themselves a bit more seriously. They started sending out cease and desist letters to anime retailers like Akadot, demanding they stop selling Full Metal Alchemist soundtracks without authorization. Isaac Liu, an Akadot representative, alleged that they tried to speak directly with Funimation, but quote, they just ignore us and went straight to our hosting company, end quote. I can't exactly blame Funimation for protecting their copyrights, Even though this may have upset some people and continues to do so as pirating sites are regularly shut down, they seem well within their rights to do so. Since studios didn't really distribute their works through official services and the catalog of anime in most streaming services is generally pretty lacking, it's no wonder piracy for anime became so common. Whether it's legally or illegally though, the demand for anime was high and Funimation cemented themselves as a quality company when it comes to distribution. They were even bought out by Sony in 2017 and began making plans to move to Cypress Waters, not far from Dallas, though they're currently located in Flower Mound, Texas. So all of this sounds really good. So what happened here? Why are we even talking about Funimation today? Well, one of their biggest controversies involves one of their biggest voice actors, Vic Mignogna. Now, before we get into the allegations, because this is where things are going to get a little rocky, this is where I'm gonna place the sponsor for today's episode. And then this is kind of your final warning, last stop. And then we're getting into the terrifying shit. The fall season is here. It literally snowed last week in Colorado. So fall is here, winter is here. The trees are actually changing colors. It's a little strange, got to admit. And while that's all happening, the year keeps getting busier and busier. And when I'm swamped, eating well is kind of a difficult thing to do. But now my freezer can stay stocked thanks to Daily Harvest. And Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbreads, smoothies, and even more built on organic fruits and vegetables. They don't use preservatives added sugars or artificial anything, and they're ready fast in just a couple minutes. Personally, I'm a massive fan of their smoothies. I cannot get over how delicious their smoothies are. And recently I've swung back from the love-hate relationship back into the love phase with the chocolate and mint or the cacao in mint smoothie. And I'm in love right now. It's perfect for fall. So enjoy this time of year even more with Daily Harvest. Make sure you go to dailyharvest.com casket and get up to $40 off your first box. That's 
dailyharvest.com slash casket for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash casket. Not long ago in the very stylish 1970s, Adam and Eve was born. And no, I'm not talking about the biblical Adam and Eve. I mean, the adult boutique Adam and Eve. They've got lingerie, games, movies, toys, and more. So no matter what you're up to, whether it's alone or maybe with a couple friends, they have it. Plus, Adam and Eve offers 24 seven customer service and a 90 day no hassle return policy. So if anything goes wrong with your order, just let them know and they'll get it taken care of for you. Plus Adam and Eve is out here doing a world of good. 20% of their profits go to fight the spread of HIV around the world. And Adam and Eve just turned 50 this year. And to celebrate their half century of sex positivity, they're giving out some amazing deals just like this one. So if you wanna try Adam and Eve and see what you can unlock on the wild side of things, make sure to go to Adam and Eve and use code CASKET to get 50% off one item and free shipping to the US and Canada. If you're an anime dubbed fan, chances are you've probably heard Vic's voice before. He's most well known for being Broly in Dragon Ball Z, but he has also voiced Edward Elric in Full Metal Alchemist and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. He's been in Yu Yu Hakuso, Neon Genesis Evangelion, Hellgirl, Claymore, Darker Than Black, Attack on Titan. The list is endless. For better or for worse, and we'll get to why in just a little bit, Vic has become a celebrity voice actor and somewhat of a staple at Funimation. Yet just a couple years ago in 2019, when it was announced that he was once again going to be voicing Broly in the latest installment of Dragon Ball Z, word began to spread that Vic had a reputation for sexually harassing and assaulting women. Now, I wanna make it clear that for legal purposes that everything is alleged here. So just so you know, before we continue onward, Anyway, according to the Dallas News, the intense fallout developed around a single anonymous tweet from Han Lea posted January 16th, the same day Dragon Ball Super Broly opened in the US. The tweet said Mignana was a homophobic, rude asshole who'd been creepy to underage female fans for over 10 years. Anime voice actor Monica Rial retweeted Han Lea's accusation. The next day, she reposted two tweets by animation and gaming aficionado, Kaylin Saucedo, that accused Mignana of great volumes of sexual misconduct and urged Funimation to reconsider its hiring of him. The Hanlea tweet was reposted more than 4,000 times and prompted more than 400 comments, including from some who share their own uncomfortable encounters with the voice actor. The hashtag kickvic chorus had begun. Years of whispers had finally culminated in outcries. Throughout all of it, Vic said that the accusations were heartbreaking and during a chat with his fan club, he wrote, I'll hug 1000 people and 999 will say, he's so kind and open and friendly with his fans. And one will say, he hugged me too tight and it was creepy. So it appears that I'm going to need to revise the way I interact with fans at conventions. But others said it wasn't just about creepy hugging, but homophobic and anti-Semitic remarks. One petition said that he'd been openly rude to fans that created homoerotic fan art or yaoi fan art in general. Vic said it was because he didn't want to sign non-canon material in general. Fans were still upset by this because even when the art wasn't sexually explicit, he wouldn't sign it, but he happily signed other fan art. And as for the supposed anti-Semitic remark, someone pointed to a moment where Vic was on a panel and refereed to a noise coming from another room and called it a Holocaust. It was tasteless, yes, but Vic said it doesn't make him anti-Semitic. And sure, on the surface, this seems pretty minor. And you know, it's very much he said, she said, or sounds kind of like a misunderstanding. But once you actually dig a little deeper, some of the stories that surfaced are kind of worrying. Organizers at conventions also shared stories where Vic allegedly overstayed his panel time and yelled at staffers. Some tweets that circulated read, I heard Vic's banned from a local con because after his panel time was up, he started signing autographs in the room, thus using the space that should have gone to the next panelist. Someone didn't get to do their panel that year because Vic decided he needed to be adored. Another post claimed that he routinely spoke in an entitled way to the staff, always saying, can you be a deer and get me a muffin and cappuccino or something of that nature because he used up his per diem. And a per diem, by the way, is a set amount of cash that he could spend at the con and Vic would apparently run through this on a Thursday night at a hotel bar, taking advantage of staffers buying him breakfasts and lunches throughout the weekend. And since so many anime cons are based so heavily on volunteer labor, it's not as if they could complain to a boss or labor union of any kind. 
This certainly isn't the worst behavior we've seen out of celebrities. It's rude though, no doubt. Another stated, 2009 Floridian con staffer here. Anyone who believed that's a rumor, let me tell you firsthand, I've never wanted to go off on someone before with the way he called us incompetent over how lighting at an angle won't let his fans see him well enough. Holy cow. There was another time where he made a huge deal about loving red velvet cake to the point where some of us went to spend our own money on some fancy cake at the fanciest shop in Tampa. We got it for him only for him to pretty much not want it. These are just tame tales. In short, dude is a nightmare as a guest to the point a majority of other guests in most Florida cons agree to appear on the condition Vic isn't there. True story. As frustrating as this might be, I think it falls into a gray area in terms of if Vic should be fired or not. Enough people came forward that I feel like at the very least, it's probably safe to say that Vic is picky, has an ego and maybe a headache to deal with, but is it worth firing him over? I would argue that's debatable, but it's the sexual assault and harassment allegations that I really wanted to get into because those obviously would be the more serious of the accusations if true. So we'll go ahead and start with the actions Vic made against fans. Again, allegedly. Firstly, sure, some fan encounters that have been brought up by the fans themselves do seem just a little bit harmless, like his whole closeness is a bit awkward as opposed to malicious. But you can only use the whole, oh, this person is a touchy feely excuse for so long. Yes, some people might like hugging others or being a bit more physical in their affection. That doesn't mean grabbing someone by the hair without consent is ever acceptable, especially when they're a minor. One young woman who we'll just call Jay was 14 years old when she attended the New York Comic Con in 2014 and actually met Vic. According to her, the encounter was really, really uncomfortable and Vic put his hand underneath her zip up sweatshirt and on her waist for the initial photo. He then kissed her cheek, the photo showing them incredibly close together. The images of this are actually available online. And I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna pretend it doesn't really make me recoil because it does. It just doesn't seem like that's how you should treat your fans, let alone minors. Like if someone asked for a kiss on the cheek, I guess that's one thing, but Jay didn't. Another young fan, Taylor, said that Vic called her adorable and when he asked if she wanted a photo, she thought, why not? My source says. He embraced her for a photograph and when the moment was over, Taylor said he hugged her and then proceeded to kiss her face. Onlookers cheered. Taylor, who identifies as queer, reiterated that she felt extremely nauseated and that the entire event feels gross when she thinks about it. No one seemed to be asking, Mignogna included, whether the other party was a willing participant or whether a celebrity should be making an intimate display towards an underage con goer, no matter the intention behind it. The line continued to blur as more individuals came forward, including one person who, at the age of 15, was given Mignogna's personal cell phone number after an encounter in his autograph line. Although this wouldn't be acceptable no matter his age, Vic is almost 60 at the time of writing this, so the age gap here is exceptionally creepy. He's not a teenager being inappropriate with other teenagers. He's honestly old enough to be their fathers or grandfathers. Yet another young fan, Azure, went and met Vic in 2006. Azure now identifies as male, but was presenting as female when he met Vic. At that time, Azure's friend joked that his costume was sexy and Vic surprisingly agreed. Vic gave him his phone number and reverse phone records prove that it was in fact his, according to my source. He and his friends would share several group calls with Mignogna. Azure said at the time that it felt validating and cool that he was giving us the time of day and attention. According to his account, the friends in Mignogna mostly discussed voice acting and the teens would request him to repeat lines. Similar to the first time Mignogna approached the friends, Azure said he often pushed for them to join his fan club to the point that Azure became uncomfortable. He also noticed that Mignogna never brought up the group's parents or whether they had permission to be chatting privately with a, at the time, 45 year old man. Vic's fan club called the Rizumbul Rangers is where Edward Elric is from in Full Metal Alchemist is incredibly devoted to Vic. Allegedly one of them, only 16 years old, claimed that they were thanked in a seductive way by Vic and had their neck kissed. And that was after he was apparently selling his anime songs and his Christian CD at a convention because apparently Vic creates Christian music as well. So that's a thing too. Some have speculated that it's actually his faith that doesn't allow him to sign the homoerotic fan art, but Vic has denied and said that he has friends that are in the LGBTQ plus community. I'm not sure Vic's exact stance on homosexuality, but his religion has created other problems with fans, apparently. 
A Jewish fan of Mignogna's work on Persona 3 left his autograph line feeling judged in 2010. The 19 year old lined up with a replica of Junpei's hat for Mignogna to sign and also grabbed a copy of his fan music CD. When their turn came, Mignogna allegedly asked them why they chose the fan music CD, but not any of his Christian music CDs. The fan apologized and stated that they were Jewish. According to them, Mignogna stared them up and down and responded by saying, well, we can change that. In yet another encounter, one cosplayer, Jesse Pridemore, said that Vic grabbed her arm and hair. Disgustingly, Vic allegedly told Pridemore that the reason she enjoyed one particular anime series was because of another voice actor's performance in it. A voice actor, by the way, that Pridemore had claimed raped her and bragged in the industry about it. When a friend approached to help Pridemore, she wrote that she did not respond because she was stunned. She claimed Mignogna pulled on her hair again with the implication that if the other voice actor had had me, he could too. She then said she left the group in tears. Fans might say that these are all just understandings and to some extent, a few of them could be, but there are just so many that it's hard to dismiss all of them like that. The downright rudeness to staff is one thing, but the way Vic got so close to teenagers on multiple occasions and the way he's allegedly touched and talked to them is really not acceptable. It does seem as if there's also been situations where he's taken advantage of the devotion of his fans, at least in one case that we mentioned earlier, but I can't be sure of that. People still have tried to ignore his behavior. Like Vic said, it's just one out of every thousand people complaining, right? Well, if you meet a thousand people in one day and only sexually harass one, does that make it okay? I'd argue it does not. Plus, while there's nothing wrong with having a close fan club, it gets worrying when these fans are so loyal that they get angry at those that speak out against literal potential criminal behavior. Monica Rial, a voice actress, spoke up and told her story in February, 2009, accusing Vic of touching her as well as colleagues without consent. I'm going to summarize her words, but if you want to read them in full, they will obviously be in my sources. According to Monica, first, please know that I've tried to address this behavior with him. Each time he would apologize and then be back at it within weeks. The studios slowly began to stop working with him, not just because of sexual harassment, but because he was difficult to work with. Whenever he saw me, he would take a fistful of my hair, pull my head back and either whisper so closely to my ear that his lips were touching or kiss my cheek slash neck. This was usually done in front of fans or colleagues. So I had to be very careful about how I reacted. I didn't even realize how inappropriate it was because he did it to so many people. I've witnessed it happen just as others have witnessed it happen to me, colleagues and fans. In the mid 2000s, we were at a convention together and he grabbed me and kissed me in his hotel room. I froze. I trusted him because he was my friend. Not only that, but he was dating my friend. I felt incredibly guilty, even though I hadn't done anything wrong. All the pictures and messages that are being passed around were taken at the press events and premiere of the Broly movie. Three of my close friends came forward. As more people came forward, I began to see the similarities. I chose to share my testimony with investigators solely because it corroborated the other's testimony. From there, Monica says that she's sorry for lashing out at fans that have been accusing her of doing this for clicks, views, or drama, and explains her and her colleagues' perspective of feeling backed into a corner. She's worried about being fired for telling the truth. She's been doxxed, received death threats, and has to speak with law enforcement and lawyers frequently because of this. The other voice actresses like Jamie Marquis also stepped forward and said that Vic had grabbed her hair before. She claimed that even though they had been friendly before hugging and kissing on the cheek, Vic had put his hand at the base of her skull and made a fist before yanking her head backwards and towards him. Though she doesn't remember exactly what he whispered to her, she says that she remembers it being sexual in nature. Jamie added that because of Vic's many fans, he was worshiped and treated with kid gloves. She said that she was a nobody by comparison and risking being blacklisted wasn't worth it. She never even considered reporting him. Vic seemingly got away with this for years, but not for long. So Funimation, right? I know we've gone off the rails a bit here on this one, but I promise this is a Funimation and Vic Mignogna episode. So how do these two collide? Well, plain and simple, they fired him. After an investigation that lasted very little time at all, he was gone. There was incredible pressure on them to do so, but at the same time, I'm happily surprised that they acted so quickly. We've seen with Activision Blizzard, Disney, Ubisoft, and plenty others that it takes years, lawsuits, and cover-ups at times for sexual abusers to actually be taken seriously and brought to the surface. But in this case, Vic was swiftly blacklisted. More accusations arose, some as far back as 1989, when one woman said that he kept making unwanted advances when they were just in high school. 
Allegations from 2008 and 2010 also appeared in the Dallas Morning News when Vic had stalked a Japanese singer and voice actor at an event, apparently pressuring her twice to sleep with him. Even if the statute of limitations has vanished for some of these earlier cases, the sheer amount of cases effectively proved to everyone around Vic that he was not to be trusted. At around the same time, Rooster Teeth also announced that they were going to be replacing Vic on their animated series, Ruby. As for Funimation though, I can wholeheartedly understand why they would let Vic go. There's photo evidence of his close encounters with fans and Jamie and Monaco were willing to risk everything to speak out. Obviously though, Vic was not thrilled about the whole situation and he filed a defamation suit seeking $1 million against Funimation, Jamie, and Monica. Ronald Toy, Monica's fiance, is also named as he got involved while defending Monica backing her up. The thing is, I have absolutely no idea how a suit against Funimation could possibly hold water. If they want to fire you, whether it's because of sexual harassment, the many fans saying they had strange encounters or anything in between, they're allowed to. I certainly didn't see them calling Vic a pedophile or a predator like plenty of other posts did. As for court documents, I was able to find the full deposition of Vic online. Though it'd be impossible to cover the entire 73 page document, here's a few highlights in regards to the case. Here's some questioning conducted by Lemoine, the defendant's attorney. Question, are you aware of there being any group of people out there in, in, in a world you refer to as the Fuhrer? Answer, yes. Question, and who refers you as you to the Fuhrer? Answer, many years ago, members of my fan club thought that it would be fun since it was kind of a nickname of the fan club, that they were kind of Rizembool, that they were rangers and somebody made it up as a joke. I had nothing to do with it. It was short-lived. I didn't make it up. I didn't condone it. It was just a something some fan made up. Now, out of context or without ever having seen Full Metal Alchemist, this looks especially concerning. So that's why I wanted to address this first because within the show, the leader of the country is just called a Fuhrer. These fans may have been using the word Fuhrer to compare Vic, their leader, to Fuhrer Bradley, the leader within the anime. However, spoiler alert here, he's not a good guy on the show. So while some people may see this as anti-Semitic, I don't think it is, but I do understand why it could raise some eyebrows. It's just very bad wording and very much an inside joke to that anime. Vic also addresses a GoFundMe account that was set up for his legal battles and claims he had no knowledge of it nor condoned anyone setting it up for him on his behalf. Fans actually donated about a quarter of a million dollars for Vic's legal battle, which though they have every right to do that, I can understand why it would be extremely invalidating for those who have allegedly been victimized by Vic's actions. Now let's get back to the questioning. Question, do you believe that you have been damaged as a result of the defamatory statements that you allege were made by the defendants in this case? Answer, yes. Question, do you have a, can you put a monetary value on that? Answer, no. Question, what would you need to know to put a monetary value on that? Answer, if I may, Sean, let me answer by saying this. I did it. I didn't want to do this. I sat by for five months and let these people destroy me online. I didn't even know what to do. I, I, I literally did not respond. I did not attack back. I didn't even defend. I just couldn't believe it was happening for five months. And when it got to the point where I had lost so much, I, I realized that the, my only recourse was legal recourse. I wasn't looking for money. I wasn't asking for anything but to be left alone and, and to, you know, be allowed to, to have my career and my work. Because of the lack of concrete evidence, I can't say that he definitively sexually assaulted someone with malicious intent. After all, this is a defamation case, not a criminal one. Like with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, because of the nature of the case, I can't attribute guilt to anyone. But are there enough accusations against him to make it concerning? Yes, absolutely. Apparently, the court seemed to agree with that sentiment because in September of that year, Judge Don Chupp dismissed Vic's case against Jamie, Monica, Ron, and the allegations that Funimation participated in tortious or wrongful interference. About a month later, the judge ordered him to pay $238,000 to the defendants for legal fees and $287,000 in contingent fees. Although this particular situation is debatable, with some Vic fans saying they mishandled it, Funimation has had other controversies over the years as well. There was backlash in 2020, for example, when they canceled the show Interspecies Reviewers because it was, well, too pornographic to meet their standards. 
Some said this was censorship. Others said, what's the point of having an option to enable or disable adult content from showing if they didn't intend to allow adult content on the platform? Frankly, Funimation can air whatever they want. I think they probably should have looked into the series before they accepted it, but I hardly see this as much of a controversy, especially given some of the more serious things we've seen on Corporate Casket episodes before. On a more serious note though, they were in legal trouble this year after an accessibility lawsuit. One legally blind individual, Jacina Angeles, brought a suit against them saying that their website, quote, failed to design, construct, maintain, and operate its website to be fully accessible to and independently usable by Angeles and other blind or visually impaired people, end quote. And this one I do blame on them. A year ago, for example, people were posting on the Funimation subreddit saying that their streaming app was long overdue for an update and the user interface was an eyesore and quite clunky to use. There's been a few other disputes as well, like when Funimation sued quite a few partners for breach of contract. There's not a ton of information about this one. It was settled and the terms of the lawsuit were not disclosed publicly. All in all though, the issues with Vic and the other voice actors that have proven to be Funimation's biggest controversy overall. And it sure doesn't seem like Vic is the only voice actor they have problems with, as audio has leaked of other Funimation voice actors making extremely offensive jokes during recordings. Some of these are homophobic slurs and others are references to incest among other things. People have said that this is just joking around and this is just crude office humor. Even if that's what it is, that doesn't really make it any less gross. Someone still has the right to say they don't wanna support someone or a company after listening to that. I haven't worked in an anime dubbing studio before, but I can say from experience that you don't need to say slurs in order to test a microphone. I can just turn on a software on my computer and make sure that all my mic settings are right. I don't have to just word vomit disgusting shit everywhere. I also won't quote any of the things they say because they're just really crude and unnecessary. Just sorry, I'm not even quoting it. Now, there are also those that believe Vic supporters revealed or at least spread this supposed recording leak as one source explains. Many Vic supporters point to the apparent hypocrisy of some of the voice actors who they view as having abandoned Vic earlier this year. If Vic was fired over a clause in Funimation's rules that these actors also appear to have violated, the line of thinking is that they all should get canned. As much as I detest the tactic and am firmly in the hashtag kick Vic camp, they aren't exactly wrong here. However, there also seems to be an assumption that those who opposed Vic will somehow reveal themselves to be hypocrites themselves. And now that actors on their side are revealed to be horribly offensive. As far as I'm concerned, clean the entire house of people like this and start over. And I feel like this one completely misses the point. None of this should be about which voice actor is the worst or to prove that they all should be fired or that Vic isn't really all that bad. The point is that all of this is unacceptable in any context. All of this just make me concerned that Vic is the tip of the iceberg. And if another damaging company culture will eventually emerge out of Funimation. I truly hope this isn't the case at this point, but for now, all we can do is wait and see. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I wanna thank you for taking some time out of your day to hang out with me. I appreciate it. And of course, I will always see you in the next one. Bye.